Hi, today we're going to discuss China's recently launched Lunar Sample Return Mission, the Chang'e 5. Later in the video, we're going to take a virtual tour of the Dynetics Human Landing System, Mako, which they just completed at their facility in Huntsville, Alabama. Stay tuned. Today's video is going to be exciting and lots of fun. Welcome to Reaching for the Moon, hosted by me, Ed Grace. For those of you that don't know me, I worked on the Apollo program for 10 years while I was at MIT and was on the Apollo 13 Mission Operations Team, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But before we start talking about the Artemis Dynetics human landing system, I'd like to give you a quick update on China's Chang'e 5 Lunar Sample Return Mission. The Chang'e 5 is an unmanned robotic Chinese spacecraft with a Lunar Sample Return Mission goal. Chang'e 5 consists of four elements, the orbiter, the landing stage, the ascent stage, and a return re-entry module. The Chang'e 5 is designed to bring Regolith back to Earth. If you know what Regolith is, please sign into the comments so I can con congratulate you. I didn't know what Regolith was and had to look the word up in a dictionary. The definition is shown on the screen right now. Regolith is a blanket of unconsolidated, loose, heterogeneous, superficial deposits covering solid rock. It includes dust, broken rocks, and other materials, and is present on Earth, the Moon, Mars, asteroids, and other terrestrial planets and moons. Chang'e 5 carries a robotic arm with a sampling scoop, a coring drill, and a sample chamber that can accommodate up to four pounds of regolith. It was launched on 24 November 2020 for the moon on the top of a Long March 5 rocket. Chang'e 5 is planned to land on the moon by the 27th of November and return to Earth around December 16th. Only the landing and ascent stages will descend to the lunar surface and will be operational for one lunar day, which is two weeks Earth time. The orbiter and return modules will stay in lunar orbit. After obtaining the samples, the ascent module will lift off the moon surface and rendezvous dock with the return module in lunar orbit. The samples will be moved to the return module, which will then exit its lunar orbit, return to Earth with a landing planned in the Inner Mongolia ground. At the present time, the Chang'e 5 is still collecting samples, some as much as seven feet underground. I'll provide an update on the Chang'e 5 mission as the information becomes available. Now, let's take a look at the Dynetics Human Landing System. Dynetics is working with a team of 25 subcontractors that include Sierra Nevada and Draper Lab. A list of the team members is shown on this slide. The mock-up includes the crew module, the autonomous logistics platform for all moon cargo access, or better known as Alpaca, the ascent and descent propellant tanks, and deployable solar arrays. There are several features that make this lunar lander stand out from the others being considered by NASA. The low slung design will allow for easier and safer access to the lunar surface. There are only six steps with railings that the astronauts have to encounter to either exit or enter the lander. Blue Origin's design, on the other hand, has a much longer ladder that must be scaled to exit or enter their lander since the lander is 40 feet tall. Definitely a plus for the Dynetics design here. The Dynetics lander is totally reusable, not so with the other designs. The Dynetics lander must be refueled, which can be done on the lunar surface if and when we can manufacture fuel on the moon or in orbit from a cargo space shift that is launched from Earth containing fuel. One of the negatives of the Dynetics design is that it is much be launched 
on the Space Launch System SLS Block 1 vehicle, which unfortunately is the most expensive launch vehicle. However, since the lunar lander is totally reusable, only a single launch is required, which is going to minimize the Artemis program costs. Recently, Dynetics completed the assembly of a mock-up of their human landing system. I have a short clip here that I'd like to take you on a virtual tour of the Dynetics human landing system, courtesy of Dynetics. So with that, why don't we have a look inside? Let's do it. So we'll start here on the back end of the crew module. This is the habitation area. Again, an area that is, is built and designed for up to four astronauts to uh, live and work while on the surface of the moon. Here they'll, they'll eat, they'll sleep, they'll drink, and they'll prepare for their EVAs. In this mock-up, we have volumetric representations of a lot of our different systems. Our Paragon uh, life support system, you can see this volumetric representation can be moved around as we uh, decide on the final placement for these systems in our architecture. It's well lit. Uh, Bionex provides our, the lighting for the crew module. And at just forward of the habitation area is the workstations for, for flying the vehicle. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what the, the flight stations look like. So let's talk a little bit about how we are going to fly the lunar landing in this vehicle. As you can see, we've got the controls and displays centered around the window field of view so the crew can maintain optimal situational awareness there. We're going to lower the vehicle down into a 100 kilometer circular orbit around the moon. When we're ready to start the landing, we will execute a burn over the north pole of the moon for about 10 seconds. That will uh, lower our orbit to about 15 kilometers. Once we start to approach the south pole, we'll begin a continuous braking burn that will last for about nine minutes. And then uh, we'll start into the landing phase, which Brew will tell you about. That landing phase begins at the end of our braking burn, at which point the vehicle will begin to pitch over. When the vehicle pitches over, the landing zone will come into the field of view through the uh, out the window views. And this will be approximately five kilometers from the landing zone at that point. And from there on in, all the way through touchdown, we fully expect the crew will have an unobstructed view of the landing zone, uh, as I say, through touchdown. Uh, there will be a point in time as we get close to the landing zone where the, the landing zone disappears below the field of view of the windows, but at that point the crew will maintain a complete visual on the landing zone through a state-of-the-art sensor suite that will allow it to persist through the harsh lunar environment of dust and, uh, and uh, sunglare. So as we come down towards the final landing, the automation will allow the crew to just maintain situational awareness on the landing site and any kind of obstructions or slope issues and then they can make minor redesignations of the landing site, allowing the vehicle to fly there. Or if they're uh, more comfortable, they'll be able to take manual control and actually fly the translation and descent uh, profile manually down to the surface. So, Brew, am I going to get this landing? Mash, I think you have to have done it before to do it again. So, this, this one's all mine. Wow. <laughs> In early 2021, NASA will evaluate each of the three designs that have been submitted for the human landing systems. They could select two or three, depending upon the funding that is available. Well, that's the end of today's video. In our next video, we're going to discuss the SpaceX human landing system and how it compares to Blue Origin and Dynetics. If you like today's video, give us a like. Hit, slam, do what you have to do on that subscribe button, but subscribe. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and remember always, failure is not an option. Bye.